Hello, everybody. Dave Neal here, stand-up comedian and host of Bachelor Recap, A Guy's Review. Today's video, I'm going to be reading 12 excerpts from Colton Underwood's new book, The First Time. Now, he released this book uh, months ago, but has since written a new afterword, which is about uh, 10 extra pages of content about how uh, the fallout that happened after his breakup with Cassie Randolph. If this story is new to you guys, uh, uh, Colton Underwood was The Bachelor, and he uh, he uh, ditched the fantasy suites and dumped the other girls to pursue Cassie Randolph. They had sort of an on-again, off-again relationship, and then after breaking up, uh, TMZ had reported that he was found to have placed a tracking device on Cassie's car. He had been seen at 3 a.m. in the alleyway behind her parents' house by her brother, and apparently he had admitted to the he admitted this to them in private. I've made over a dozen videos talking about everything from uh, pure, uh, purity culture, toxic love addiction, codependency, uh, manipulation. Uh, we're going to look at this book. I'm going to read some excerpts, and maybe we can get a better understanding understanding on how a um, a nice Christian man. A former tight end in the NFL could uh, potentially uh, ruminate and spiral into uh, such depths as stalking his ex. And uh, and also, I'm going to read an excerpt about why he didn't want to break up. And it's very interesting. You know, I, you know, I've been. You know, some people have said, "Oh, I'm too hard on him." Some people think I'm obsessed. But uh, this is a case study for human dynamic. This is a case study for how we are in relationships. How even good people can fall into obsessive tendencies, manipulation, and things like that. So let's get into these um, excerpts. The first seven are from uh, the uh, end of the book uh, before the new afterword. So I'm going to read a few excerpts from before he uh, rewrote the afterword, and then I'm going to read five excerpts uh, from that. Um, don't get your hopes up if you think he's going to address his, um, you know, uh, uh, the court date that was dropped or this or that. This is a, I don't want to call it a rewriting of history, but um, uh, it is omitting gigantic things that happened uh, in the last year. But we'll talk about it, so we'll get into it. Leave a comment, hit the like button. Let me know what you guys think about all this. So let's start off right now. Uh, the first excerpt, page 253, is when Cassie meets Colton's parents in Spain for the first time. Good idea to read a few of these things to kind of get the dynamic of their relationship. Also important to remember, this book was written by Colton Underwood. He says he has Cassie's um, a write-off on it all, but you know, Cassie seems to be an agreeable person. She probably wants nothing to do with any of this, so we can't take this for, for uh, what it's worth, or we can take it for what it's worth, which is one side of a story. So his side, her side, the truth in between. All right, Cassie meets uh, Colton's parents in Spain for the first time. Her eyes met mine, and they were filled with fear. I said to myself, oh shoot, she's about to break up with me again. It turned out Cassie had been having a, a panic attack inside the van. She'd freaked herself out. What if my parents didn't like her? What if the entire family didn't like her? We walked to a nearby beach, sat down, and I listened. For whatever reason, she chose that moment to open up about her ex and how that relationship had made her feel controlled and manipulated. And as she said, I know you aren't in any way like that, but I don't know. Maybe I've got some PTSD right now. Maybe... Uh, that's women's intuition. I don't know for sure. Maybe this was just her uh, survival mode, knowing something was off with Colton and she was seeing some of these manipulating and controlling tendencies. Maybe not, but very interesting to read this, that before she even met Colton's parents, she was already feeling like she was in too deep and didn't have control. Page 263, happy couple hideaway before the world knew they were together. So happy couple hideaway is what they call it when you've already um, been through the process of falling in love and, uh, and being on the show, but it's not it, the show hasn't aired yet. So they uh, put the Bachelor um, in the Bachelorette. They'll put them in different Airbnbs and scatter them around and kind of give them a free place to stay um, you know, to make sure they're not in the public. Uh, he said, I made coffee in the morning, but always left a little coffee puddle on the counter that needed wiping up. Cass was forgiving to a point. I crossed the line when I used her toothbrush. It grossed her out. I was like, what's the big deal? We make out, swap spit, what's the difference? Now look, this isn't much of a juicy quote, but I also found that disgusting that he's just, next thing you know, he's just using her toothbrush. You know, some things are better left, you know, not uh, not sharing. You know what I mean? Share the remote control, don't share the toothbrush. What do you guys think? Toothbrush sharing? You know, I mean, maybe like in a pinch, but don't just come out there, you know, I don't know. All right. Page 265, receiving advice from Becca Kay and Garrett on how to deal with the show uh, with the show airing. I reached out to Becca and asked her to speak with Cassie. The four of us actually got on the phone together, me and Cass and Becca and Garrett, and Becca said, you guys know what you have. Don't worry about what's going on in the show or what people are saying about you. Focus on the truth and growing your relationship. Now, very interesting that Colton had wanted to set up 
other contestants that have quote unquote made it work as we know they didn't, but at the time had made it work and wanted to sort of help calm Cassie down. It's a common theme here that Cassie knew something was wrong, whether it's her own anxiety, her intuition, whatever it is, she wasn't in the relationship 1000%. There was always this, oh, what if, you know, kind of feeling. So Colton arranges Becca Kay and Garrett to give her advice. Really bad in hindsight. You know, the last thing you want in a relationship is to get advice from Becca Kay and Garrett. You know, they didn't, you know, because they said focus on the truth and growing your relationship relationship, but they couldn't really do that. Um, in the end, they uh, broke up this year. All right. Page 265. Colton watched the hometowns episode with Cassie's family. Very interesting. In the part where I told Cassie that he, her dad, hadn't given me his blessing, Matt actually paused the TV and said, did you really think I was going to give you permission after just six weeks? Every head in the room turned in my direction. I shrugged. It was actually kind of funny. This is really funny to me because like in the moment, he's like, oh, I didn't get his permission. The dad pauses it and goes, you really think I was just going to give away my daughter to you, bro? And he's like, yeah, you know what? That's kind of right. You got a good point. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of, uh, you know, maybe I went a little too far there. Um, page 267. After the finale aired, I moved to Los Angeles to be closer to Cass. She got an apartment with her sister in West Hollywood and worked to juggle graduate school and internship, her family and a persistent, pestering, sometimes annoying boyfriend, me. This is where it's interesting because at this point, we know that he had been accused of stalking her uh, with some credible, um, you know, evidence. And uh, he calls himself a persistent, pestering, and sometimes annoying boyfriend. He decides to live to move walking distance to her apartment. This is a girl who wasn't ready for marriage, wasn't ready for engagement, and then still w likes the guy. And then he moves walking distance away from her. It might have been a psychological thing, but I feel like she needed to like live on the west side. He lives in Hollywood, you know, on the other side of the 405. If you live in LA, you know what I'm talking about. Just give me a little space here. There's just something a little bit controlling when like you live walking distance. I'm not saying like you should ever lie to your, your significant other, but like if she just needs a day off or something, maybe she wants to be a little farther away from you. That's just a thought. And also like, did she give him permission to move next to her? You know, I mean, you'd think if they were dating, they'd want to be close, but also as we know how this turns, once the relationship's over, do you want your ex living in walking distance from you? You know what I mean? All right. Page 269, the beginning of the end. I joined Cassie and her family for their annual pilgrimage to the Stagecoach Country Music Festival. Eager to impress and ingratiate myself, I used my new celebrity clout to rent a house and get VIP passes and perks that I thought would make it even more memorable. It didn't, and it's probably best to leave it at that. So I don't know what that means. That's a whole story not told. So he gets he gets the whole family some big VIP press passes. They must have had a falling out, or maybe there was too many influencers. Like it's, an, it's a family that just wants to listen to country music. And the next thing you know, you got all these different bachelor contestants trying to mooch off, you know, get selfies in front of a carousel. Cassie and I broke up. It boiled down to me wanting to get engaged, wanting to set a timeline and simply putting too much pressure on her when in reality, none was needed. I wanted more. She wanted me to relax and smell the roses. In other words, don't push, don't pressure. I interpreted that to mean she didn't care about the relationship. The night will not go down as one of our best, and Cass left my house in tears. Later, she pledged to help me have a better relationship with her family, and I promised to chill. So it's kind of hard to even follow this. They broke up, then got back together in the same couple paragraphs. Uh, but again, we're talking codependency, counterdependency. He's pushing, timeline, engagement, this and that, because it, it's, you know, like he can show her off with a ring, trophy, possession, purity, purity culture. He lost his virginity to her, you know, maybe. He doesn't really go into details, but I think we can assume that. And, um, and she's like, look, whoa, calm down, smell the roses. So they're totally on different sort of wavelengths with what they want. Um, in the end, you got to treat a relationship with, with some, you know, delicacy sometimes. If somebody likes you, but, you know, you got to move at their pace, there is no rush. There is no rush. Um, and then people in the comments are always saying, oh, she let him on, this and that. Well, I mean, look, come on. She's a grad student. She's, uh, you know, an intern still. She's not ready for that next step yet. Sometimes it can come sooner than later, but she just wasn't there. And the more he kind of pressures it, the farther it's going to push her away. That's just the uh, the crux of how it works. Page 270. Navigating a relationship in public is a unique experience. We can't have an argument in a restaurant without someone posting a photo that we're breaking up. Paparazzi follow us at the grocery store, the coffee shop, at the beach. I have to have empathy for this situation. It must suck. It must suck to have a little tiff to not be feeling well, have a little headache, your girl's hangry, whatever it is. It's got to be tough that you just can't live your life. I totally, I just included this because, you know, we forget that uh, with celebrity comes, you know, an invasion of privacy and that really stinks.
Page 274. Okay, so this is where the afterword begins. This is all brand new stuff that just came out this weekend. And I have to tell you guys this. I felt I felt the need to buy this book because whether you um, support someone or not, I'm not trying to rip off all of his content here. These are just excerpts. If you want to check it out, link in my description. It's on Amazon. You know, it's got hardcover, you know, pictures in it, nice gloss photos. I mean, I'm not here to promote it. I'm just saying you can disagree with someone, but as a creative, and he is, he is an author, whether you uh, believe it or not, he wrote this with the help of some publishers. But as a creative, I think it's important to support other creatives. And if you don't want to, that's fine too. If you weren't going to buy his book, this certainly wasn't going to change your mind. Page 274. He says, we didn't live together, but I moved within walking distance of the apartment Cass shared with her sister, Michelle. And we were closer than I imagined ever being with another human being. Again, like I said, living close to her apartment when they were on again, off again, uh, you know, it might have just been him saying like, look, all right, you're busy. You have an internship. No worries. I'll move closer. It's kind of like, I, I get it. Hey, I talk about this because I'm a codependent. I can think like one. I've never put a tracking device on someone's car, but I can kind of untangle the Christmas lights here and go, oh, geez, this guy was looking for that love that he just couldn't get. You got to find the love in here, folks. You got to feel, and again, we're talking coronavirus, lockdown, stay-at-home order. The, the, the worst of his ruminating and obsessiveness happened when everything else around him was canceled. And that's where we see like the insides. Like, what are we made of? You know what I mean? And he probably got frightened. I would have if I you know did what he did. Page 277. After recovering from COVID at Cassie's parents' house. Uh, then came another unexpected twist. Once I felt strong enough to return to my place in LA, I couldn't leave. All of us were under stay-at-home orders. The Randolphs didn't need a reminder of how weird and inconvenient coronavirus had made life in their house. I ate everything in their fridge and pantry. They even had a mini intervention to tell me that I was eating too much peanut butter, and I was. Look, your boy Dave eats a lot of peanut butter. I totally relate. Right out of the jar. You know, just leave that spoon in there, just like, you know, my Excalibur sword, and just pulling it out. Chunky, creamy, doesn't matter. Salted, unsalted, you're boiling it at all. I'm like Pooh Bear, which went, you know. Anyway, um, so he was recovering from the coronavirus on the third floor, so he wasn't allowed to interact. He was on his own floor. He had 102 fever. It was really interesting to read about this. I had, in the past, accused him of maybe fibbing about the coronavirus, just because, and it's as crazy as it sounds, there's a lot of other deception that happened between him and Cassie, and it felt like a pity thing while they were breaking up. She didn't want to break up while he had coronavirus, obviously. But what's interesting here is he says he couldn't leave her and her parents' house because they were under stay-at-home orders. That's not what stay-at-home orders are. We were all part of it. It doesn't mean you can't go back to your house. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, 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 you can go back to your house. It means you can't, you know, you couldn't just uh, you go out dining, whatever. Very strange that he was kind of like, he was kind of like the house guest everyone hates that just won't leave. They're like, dude, you got to go. Stop eating the peanut butter. You're out. Go home. You know what I mean? Grab some Lysol and go home. Very strange. You ever see the movie, What About Bob? It was Bill Murray's best movie ever, but like he was Bob. He, well, every, Bob was likable, but you get, you get the idea. Richard Dreyfus. Okay, this might be the most interesting uh, excerpt from the whole books. Uh, check this out. Page 277, Cassie begins to break up with Colton again. He says, she took me aside and told me she was struggling with everything in our relationship and didn't know what to do. Her eyes were full of tears as she tried to explain, struggling to find the right words and reasons that made sense. None did, at least not to me. Finally, I put my finger to my lips for silence. She stopped mid-sentence and lowered her eyes. Both of us had always agreed to avoid finishing hard conversations like this one. We didn't want to come to the conclusion that we weren't good for each other. We were scared of confronting that truth, so we didn't. Cassie didn't want to break up until we were past the coronavirus. So literally, he's getting dumped, and he puts up his fingers like, stop dumping me, and that was the end of it. And she's like, all right, look, if you're not ready for this, you're not ready for this. Very interesting that he's writing this, that, you know, that um, they weren't ready for tough, like uh, they both agreed not to finish. You're supposed to finish tough conversations, guys. This is how it works. You don't just put these things off. You know what I mean? They're just sweeping a lot of dust under the rug here, and they're going to have to deal with this later on. Very interesting. Page 280. You don't need to be a therapist to understand why I was so re uh, resistant. I didn't want to break up. I didn't want to accept that Cass wanted to break up with me. I didn't want it to be over. I didn't want any of this to be real. And this is probably the most honest thing he wrote in the whole thing. He didn't want it to be over. Page 280. So what happened was they broke up, right? So they broke up, and... He wasn't willing to, to accept that. They didn't want, you know, 
They were supposed to make a joint statement. He just put it off. He was just draining the shot clock. He had the ball and he didn't want to give it back. And Cassie seemed to be pretty respectful where she was like, look, you know, can we make the statement now? Can we make the statement now? And he just didn't want to do it. He wasn't willing to accept that they were breaking up. And you'll see time and again, he keeps on thinking that the relationship isn't over. Maybe I'll go home to Colorado. I'll give it time. Maybe she'll change her mind. You know, like he doesn't respect her choice. And maybe partly that's because she's been um, kind of um, on again, off again with him before. But, you know, deep down, he needs like a best friend to be like, bro, listen to what she's telling you. She's not wanting you. It's over. She needs, you know what I mean? And he, no one was giving him that advice or if they were, he was just ignoring it. Page 280. Did they hook up again? Here's where it gets interesting. Let's read this. I let some time pass, and when I got back to L.A., I called Cassie and asked her out for dinner. So they had been broken up uh, a couple months by this point. She looked great. Restaurants with outdoor seating were open, and we hit it off like none of the past five months had ever happened. Afterwards, she came back to my place where we had a few drinks, hung out, and we were Colton and Cassie again the rest of the night. Then, when we woke up the next morning, I could tell everything was different. I had the urge to say I love you before she walked out the door, and I sensed she did too. No door shut that softly has ever made a louder sound. My heart was broken. Look, heartbreak can lead to some poetry. And I got to tell you, love Colton, hate Colton, that's a line. That's a line. Read that again. No door shut that softly has ever made a louder sound. My heart was broken. You got to believe him there. You got to believe him there. It doesn't mean he didn't create a wrecking ball situation for Cassie, but the guy was love scorned for sure. Hopefully he never... Uh, obsesses over somebody to this level again. And I hope, same thing for you guys, you know what I mean? Gotta let these things burn off, but we all go through this. This is why this story has been so interesting for us. What's interesting though with this excerpt is um, he goes, this is his yada, yada, yada moment. You know, what'd you do? Ah, yada, 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 you know? He, um, he says, uh, afterwards, she came back to my place where we had a few drinks, hung out, and we were Colton and Cass again the rest of the night. What does that mean, that Colton and Cass the rest of the night? It means they hooked up. They broken up. They hooked back up again. And this is great. You know, people break up and they hook back up because it doesn't count against your number. You know what I mean? Everyone's worried about that coveted number. It's like, come on, you've already hooked up. Do it again one more time. But, um, you know, you can have sexual chemistry and it not work out for other reasons. Maybe, and a lot of times what happens with codependence, like flare-ups and obsessiveness is that you're normal in the moment. It's when you're not with them. So when the person pulls away, that's what creates this vacuum of insanity where you can start being like, I'm going to track you. I'm going to create a fake phone number and find out what you're doing. I need to know that you're, you know, you still like me. I need all these things. He wanted to connect all these unknowns with ways that he could control it. And you just can't do that in a healthy relationship. You just can't do that. You know, you got to respect the other person not wanting to be with you. You can't track where they're going. If they're lying to you, that should be their true colors and you should be, you know, ready to move on. You can't track somebody, folks. It's illegal. Served up to 364 days in a county jail in California. It's illegal. Of course, she dropped the charges, and um, but she hasn't made one statement about it. She's trying to move on, and you got to respect that. She's trying to move on, but unfortunately, her ex is writing book and uh, chapters and this and that, so not addressing the, uh, you know, the big things uh, coming off like a hero. All right, page 281, ending thoughts. One of the last sentences he wrote, he says, whatever I do, I want to be known for quality, honesty, humor, and a good time. Sounds like a dating profile, right? Look, I mean, hey, if you want to be known for honesty and quality, you have to have a full, complicated conversation with somebody in the public eye that talks about what got you to the level of duct taping a tracking device to your on-again, off-again girlfriend or ex-girlfriend's car under the hood, under the trunk. You did it, talk about it. Talk about what got you to that point. You can't necessarily rewrite history like this stuff didn't happen. You want to move on and, you know, it, do big things. He says he's got TV shows in the works. I can't imagine anyone's going to go near you with a 100-foot pole if you're not going to address that you stoop to levels that are dangerous for you, for her, and it's not okay. And judging by the thousands of you that have commented on these videos... Everyone's dated a guy like this, apparently. And maybe I've been like this guy, you know, where I'm thinking I can just turn, ch change someone's mind. Oh, they just don't know. They don't love me enough. They need, they need to see me do this. They need to know that I'm the one, this and that. He took it too far. And, and I think, you know, if, if any of us were to, were to talk about Colton Hunter, we'd be like, oh, I could never be that guy. That guy's nuts. Well, look, you can, you can look at um, what got him there. A guy who wants to be loved and he wasn't going to get it from Cassie, not what he needed. 
And maybe he finds out he needs to get that on his own. Relationships are supposed to be dessert, not the main course. Okay, guys? So if you feel like you need someone else's love and you're codependent and you put someone else's needs ahead of your own, that should be a warning sign to you that you're not filling up your own love well. So get out there, run some, you know, run a 5K, get a hobby. And unfortunately, during the pandemic, he was just sitting around creating up snares and how he's going to win her back. You can't just bench press your way out of this one, bro. That's the moral of the story. So anyway, let me know what you guys think. And by all means, if you want to buy the book, I fully support people supporting uh, each other. So go check that out. And, um, and if you don't, and if this is all you needed to get out of it, that's fine too. Um, I struggle with wanting to support somebody who hasn't quite addressed all of the things that he did. Do you know what I mean? It's so much easier for someone to be like, look, I messed up big time. I did X, Y, and Z. I was wrong. I think in society, we're pretty reasonable. I think if he gets a podcast and he wants to talk about addictive love or what led him up to value her and purity culture and how he needs to realize that, you know, I would support all of that. But we got to address the elephant in the room, don't you guys think? Let me know what you think. Hit the like button. I'll see you tonight for the Pacific West Coast live stream. That's 10 p.m. after tonight's episode of Matt James season of The Bachelor. And then, of course, we'll be doing the recaps the morning after. So anyway, hit the like button, leave a comment, let me know what you guys think, and I'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.